All right, are you building your e-commerce business and you're just trying to decide, okay, where am I going with things? Well, today for inspirational purposes, I've brought on board uh, Mike Jackness, the host of the Ecom Crew podcast. And Mike actually recently um, sold one of his businesses he had four brands and he sold one and it was a seven figure exit. And on top of that, even with having sold that successful business, he's still doing over seven figures in e-commerce. So Mike, thank you so much for being here on maximizing e-commerce today. Yeah. I love doing these things and excited to chat with you today and it should be a fun talk. Yeah, it should be a great talk. And, um, you know, you're also going to be speaking at Brand Accelerator Live, which is super excited that you'll be there. I am. Uh, yeah. I was just talking to time. Scotty V right before we got on the, uh, on the air here today. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. 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 Scott, um, uh, super excited about it. And I know we're super excited to have you there. And, you know, the, I, I know you'll bring a lot of uh, value to that. Uh, now you and I had met, um, a couple of times at Seller Summit previously. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'd also, uh, was on your podcast about a year ago and I just have to commend you because you were the one that pushed me to get a full-time virtual assistant. Nice. <laughs> She's just now recently gotten to her one year, uh, working with me and I cool. probably wouldn't have done a full-time virtual assistant even to today, but everyone I talk to when they talk about, you know, should I hire a part-timer or full-timer? I'm like, if you're even on the fence or even close to the fence, just get the full-time VA because I think it's definitely worth it. Yeah. I mean, you'll find things for them to do. Uh, even if you think you only have five hours worth of stuff for them to do a week, yeah, you'll find other things to do. I mean, there are so many leaks in your business and your life of things that you're mm -hmm. doing that you could have someone else do for a fraction of the price and, uh, and free your time up to do something that's more valuable and you will definitely find something for them to do. And, you know, when you're talking about hiring a, a Filipino VA, the, the math is easier. Like if it's someone that's right. in the U.S. at the same level, you're paying them 10K a month. Yeah, it's obviously, that's a big decision to make. But for 600 bucks a month or 500 bucks a month or whatever you pay a VA over mm -hmm. there, uh, it's a pretty easy decision to just go ahead and, and do it and find things for them to do. Yeah. And one thing, I, I, at first when you had said like, you know, what it would cost, I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, you know, they can they live off of that? And then I came to realize my VA, it was she was getting a sizable raise off of what her previous job was and yeah. she wasn't having to travel one hour each way to her job. She just would, you know, roll out of bed and go to her living room and yeah. <laughs> so for her, it was great. I've been very hygienic, but she's doing a great job. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm sure she's going to showers. Good deal. Good deal. So for people that aren't familiar, can you tell just a little bit about, you know, your, um, your journey in e-commerce? Yeah. I mean, so I, quit my job back in 2004. So I mean, I've been doing some sort of online and digital marketing type thing for, for a pretty long time now, over 15 years, which is just absolutely crazy to even say out loud. Um, and in 2012-ish, I ended up in e-commerce. It was a long journey, but uh, mm -hmm. again, doing affiliate marketing and SEO and uh, uh, just, just content marketing, things of this nature. Uh, I was buying domain names and, and doing those types of things with that. And one of the domains that I had purchased along the way was treadmill.com. And that's actually how I got into e-commerce. One day I was out on a hike and I had been running treadmill.com for as an affiliate type website. And I was like, you know what? Like I'm sick of basically not giving a lot of value in the world. Uh, it was kind of one of these things where I'm just like, what I'm doing isn't, it's not a moral because it wasn't a question of that, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't like, it didn't make me feel good. You know, it's just, I was kind of doing some soul searching on this hike and um, you know, you're, you're writing about products. The people that are paying you the most money are the ones that like rank number one, they come to your site, you send them off to sports authority or something to go buy the treadmill. You're not really adding a lot of value uh, in, in life and into the world. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I want to start running a, a site that I'm going to sell these things directly. And, that's what we did. And I didn't know what the hell I was getting myself into. Um, but we did it anyway. <laughs> and uh, the rest <laughs> is history. Yeah. Well, good deal. So you started off with treadmills and then you branched off into some other things. Um, so you recently sold your business. Now, what, tell us a little bit about how, how that went and how you decided which business to sell. Yeah, I mean, so we, we started Treadmill, like I said, like in 2012. We sold that in 2015, January of 2015, because 
I just kind of realized that that was not the niche I wanted to be in. You learn things along the way and drop shipping, big heavy pieces of equipment was definitely not what I wanted to do. So at the same time I sold treadmill, one of the other businesses we bought and started was icewraps.com, which is one that we still have. It's our biggest business. And uh, shortly thereafter we, we bought or just start, we started actually from scratch color it, uh, which was a, a coloring book geared towards adult company uh, mm-hmm. and all the supplies around that. And we started a couple other brands since then as well. And we've done well. I mean, like it's, it's been one of these crazy ride things. We were on this rocket ship, like holding on with our fingernails at all, at all costs. <laughs> and so that basically our, our lives from 2000, January from 2015 until we sold uh, in, in early 2019 was these years of hundred percent growth, year over year growth. Um, you know, going from, a half a million to a million to one million to two to two to four, four to eight. I mean, it's a pretty crazy, uh, pretty crazy time. And it, that's stressful. I mean, it's, it's, I don't care who you are. Like, I, I think I'm pretty good at handling all that, but uh, it's, it's really stressful. And another component to that was uh, because it's an inventory business. We also amassed $1.3 million in, in inventory along the way. Um, and we self-funded all of this. I mean, we didn't have a, a venture capital person come in and it was, you were playing with our money and it was just time, you know, it was time to take some chips off the table. Um, and so we did. And like, as you mentioned before, I mean, it was a, it was a seven figure exit. So it was a pretty meaningful amount of money, life changing amount sure. of money. Um, and it allowed us to realign our, 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 risk, I guess, risk profile would probably be the best way to put it. You know, so instead of having $1.3 million in inventory, now we have about 700 K. Um, and somehow that feels comfortable. I don't, I mean, if you, if you had told me years ago, like you're going to have 700 K of inventory, uh, I would have been like, that's, that's insane. But when you coming down from 1.3, it feels more comfortable. We paid off. We had some debt against inventory, uh, mm-hmm. which I think is necessary to, to be able to grow. And we've actually paid all that off, even though you can make a good business case to keep debt against inventory in an inventory based business. Uh, so it just allowed me to, to just be a more free thinker, um, to, to just have less stress and, and not have to worry about, uh, those types of things anymore. And, you know, there's, there's no debt service to pay, pay or worry about. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's a different mind headspace at this point. And, uh, you know, and I also think that it's important at some point to, to have, a finish line to just have closure end the chapter kind of thing at, at some points in your life. And that was another important thing because we had been running at this crazy growth rate for so long that the chapter that was afraid that we were going to write it someday would be, you know, Amazon suspended our account for some stupid reason and we didn't have the cash flow to sustain that. And we went bankrupt and had nothing to show for it. And so that was certainly a long shot potential of how things could work out. And, and that was starting to, to, I was spending all my time thinking about that worst case scenario rather than running my business. So there was a few things that led up to that, but now that it's done, uh, it feels great. And uh, on to the next thing. Well, gotcha. There, yeah. There's definitely a lot to unpack there. That's uh, yeah. quite the story there. So, um, you know, one of the things I like that you just mentioned was talking about closure and going to another chapter. So what did it feel like writing the final sentence, so to speak, in that chapter and going to the next one? Yeah, I think I look at this a lot differently than other people. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people about this and, you know, the common thing is, you know, do you, do you miss it? Do you, how much do you think about it? Um, it for me, it, it was kind of transactional in some way, which is kind of mm-hmm. weird as much as, as it was my baby and all these different types of things that right. people go through emotionally. Um, you know, I don't really live in the past and, and regret things. So to me, it was just, uh, if I was going to say what the final sense was, it would be, uh, it was a great ride. Uh, right. and, uh, you know, and thank you for, for everything that this is, you know, you know, allowed me to become and, and, and do. And, you know, catch up with me in the future. Let me know how things are going kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's, it, it, it's interesting because I've been through these types of transactions before. I mean, we've been in business, like I said, for a long time and we've had other seven figure exits. So it didn't feel the same as it did the first time, you know, so mm-hmm. it definitely wasn't the same level of emotion or mm. celebratory thing. I'm also feel a lot differently about money at this point in my life. I'm more of a minimalist and have a lot of what I need anyway, or everything I need. 
Um, so like I didn't go buy anything or go do anything different the next day that I was, that I was doing before. So it was, it was weird on all, on all those different aspects. Um, but you know, I, it's hard to say, like, I don't know exactly how I would word that one sentence. I have to pack a lot of words into that, but, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's free me to go do the, to, to go do the next thing or, or to, to continue doing with the, some of the same things and not have to stress as much. So mm -hmm. I mean, at, at some point, Uh, so it, it helped you so you didn't have to stress as, quite as much oh hey mike personal well-being is more important than can you hear me yeah i can hear you now sorry okay uh, you broke sorry. up there I don't know for a while the internet uh, uh, basically was you were saying yeah my i think it might have been my internet was cutting out there for a while okay. but you were basically saying that you were you were feeling like you didn't have to stress out quite as much as uh you did before yeah i mean that definitely was the biggest impact it was just a, a stress reducer i would mm -hmm. say that that you know so it, maybe that's the way that the the chapter closes is stress right. level goes from from 10 down to to one uh, it's a, it was a pretty big dramatic shift wow so basically so going from and it sounds like you had a lot on your plate with four businesses, but you know, you still have three and to your point, you still have $700,000 worth of inventory. So it's, and you still have an Amazon account and there's still that kind of thing that everyone has in the back of their head of, you know, what happens if, you know, some algorithm shift makes something off in your business and Amazon comes down on you, even if temporarily. So that's always a fear. So I guess what was the biggest thing that made you go from a 10 to a one? Yeah. So there's, it's going to be interesting to see how I think about these types of things. But I think because, you know, I have a, I'm kind of a numbers guy. I'm an analytical guy. I also have a, a years of a poker background as well, playing poker and being my, when I left in 2004 to, uh, to, to start that first business, it was an online poker affiliate marketing company. So I was really big mm -hmm. in the numbers and, and, and thinking of things in these statistical terms. And, you know, if you're, if you're playing a game of poker and, you know, you're playing no limit hold'em, let's say, and you have an opportunity sure. to, to go all in uh, and you're a 51% favorite, you're going to do it because like over right. time, you know, you're, even though it sucks, like you're going to lose about half the time and win about half the time, you're, you're, you have a 2% edge there. It's a small edge, but over time you're, you're going to come out ahead. And in poker, like realistically, like the best you could ever do would be like to be like a 65 or a 70% favorite. Even, even if you have like a really good hand, you still, um, you're still not guaranteed to win. You know, was, I, I'd seen the craziest things happen. So relating that to business and this and, and your question, you know, I felt like um, with what we were doing when we first got into Amazon stuff, we were probably in the the 95% chance to win kind of category. I mean, it was just one of these amazing once in a lifetime type opportunities. It was, it was hard to kind of screw it up, but things have started to change. And I would say that, um, you were probably were more in the, the 80% tile of what we were doing and, and a 20% chance of, of failure. Maybe there's a 10% chance of absolute failure, like the binary Amazon shuts your account down and you're just mm -hmm. screwed. So, you know, someone came to you kind of relating this now back to the business thing. If someone came to you and said, Hey man, we can play a game. Um, your 80% chance to win. We're going to roll a, a 10 sided die uh, and you get one through eight and, and I get, uh, or you get you know, one through eight and I get nine zero. Um, and your, your 80% chance to win, if, if we played that for a hundred bucks, you would do that all day long. Like you probably mm -hmm. can sustain a really bad losing streak because the things can happen right. where it comes up nine and zero quite a bit, you know, it could happen 10, 12 times in a row or something crazy, but you would, you could sustain that because you have enough to, to play that game for a hundred bucks over and over and over again. Um, and everyone's number for that is different. But for me, I felt like I was playing that game for a million dollars, right? Or just like, you know, so you put it in those terms where yes, most likely everything's going to be fine. But when you're talking about doing it for, it was more like $2 million, uh, you know, the Delta between what I could get to sell one of my businesses to worst case scenario of like Amazon shuts my account down. Now I got this $1.3 million in inventory, but I can't pay my mortgage or my taxes or whatever with, Right. and I'm going to liquidate it for like a penny or two on the dollar. So, you know, I end up with, with absolutely nothing. And I'm like basically financially destitute to uh, you know, I've got a couple million dollars in the bank cash and can still run a business that's cash flowing. 
uh, that was like literally the disparity. It's pretty binary. Like if something like that were to happen. So playing that game at some point, you just can't take the risk anymore. And that's kind of where I felt like I was and why the stress level was so high. Cause every day I'd wake up and worry about getting that dreaded email from Amazon. Cause it would destroy me. Now it would suck, but it, you know, I would just go on with my life. You know, it, it would be, we could sustain it for the few weeks while we'd be suspended, hopefully get the thing reopened. Yeah, it would be stressful, mm-hmm. but we'd be fine. Like everything would be fine. There would be, you know, nothing would change in my life. We'd be fine. Versus the reality was that it wasn't going to be fine. Like, and I knew it. Like, I mean, I knew because I've you know, been in business for a long time. We're really good with our financials. Like, I'm good with money and numbers. And I knew that we were setting ourselves up to be in a position where in the worst case scenario, we would not be able to survive it. And those things happen in life. I mean, mm-hmm. once you've been around on the planet for 40 years, uh, <laughs> you've been through things that happen where it's really improbable and it should never have happened, but yet here it is. And it just happened to you. And, um, you know, it, it on a, on a small scale day to day, the chances are very small for anything like that happening. But, uh, I felt like over time we were setting ourselves up for, for complete disaster or something like that were to happen and didn't want to be in that situation. That's, that's interesting to hear your, your, your take on risk. So, um, you know, you're, you're basically talking about how it's almost like you cashed out an insurance policy. Yeah. So that, that way the color, it became your insurance policy or cashing out insurance policy, depending on how you look at it. So that now everything else you're doing, if something bad happened, you have this, that you cashed out that makes it so that you could keep running and not have to worry about it. So that, that helps me understand yeah. how you went from a 10 to a one. So yeah. it, it's, it's fascinating hearing your, uh, your take on risk. So one of the things I also wrote down, I wanted to um, catch back up on was you talked about, you know, hundred percent year over year growth sustained for a few years, which is yeah. almost unheard of. Yeah. It's so tough. That's a lot of, going all in I would imagine so can you tell me like what what was that like along the way and how did you manage the cash flow because cash flow is you know more of a struggle than I think a lot of people realize getting into it and then they get involved and they're like oh wow this really is a lot it was tough it was definitely stressful it was definitely tough um it was also exciting you know because you're on this (laughs) you know crazy growth period and so there's, there's a few things to talk about there I mean first of all the just starting from ground zero um, because I had been in business before and, and been through these types of things. We went into this always knowing our numbers. A lot of people don't do accounting properly. They don't know their PL properly. They don't know their balance sheet. They don't know how to project cash flow. I'm lucky enough that I've been through all that. Uh, they don't pay, the, they don't send money aside to pay taxes, whether they're sales taxes or, or federal or state you know, income taxes, whatever. Um, so I, I understood all that going into it and we made sure from day one that all of our accounting was in really good order from, from order number one in e-commerce that so we, we knew what was going on. Um, so that helped me make sure I was making the right decisions along the way. Uh, very important component that I think, uh, if, if, if I was younger and running some of our first businesses where I didn't have that, we would have gone bankrupt. I would have just not been able to understand things well enough to be able to run them as as crazy thin as we did from a cash position at times um, because I just wouldn't have known better. So that, that definitely helped. Um, we didn't take any money out of the business. We took no salary. So we were just running at full speed without having to, to, to live off that business at the time, uh, which I realized is a position that most people can't and aren't in. And, uh, and I respect that and understand that we were very fortunate from that perspective. Um, we, we had savings from the previous businesses that we had run and we were, we were able to live off of that. I made a commitment and a decision to do that. And we're, we were good with letting the business grow and materialize in that way as long as we weren't having to continue to put more and more money into it past our initial mm. uh, investment. And we did put six figures into it to start with. Um, so from there, you know, it was a combination of Amazon loans, uh, bank loans. Uh, and we had a friend from our previ- you know, previous life and business that uh, – gave us a line of credit with a minimum payment of interest only. So we were able to, that really helped with cash flow because we weren't having to make big payments every month towards that debt. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was definitely intense and scary. There was the, the, the worst time I remember pretty clearly was about year three uh, was, you know, there's this, this gauntlet 
uh, of the year that you have to go through every year of having to prepare for the holidays. Oh yeah. <laughs> so there's like this huge cash outlay for that. And then having to reorder mm-hmm. to, to have enough inventory after the holidays and then have another order in because there's Chinese new year mm-hmm. that comes up in China and then having to pay your taxes. So like the worst day was April 15th for us every year, not because right. of having to pay the taxes, but because of like having to come up with the money right. to deal with that. Cause you're paying a huge inventory uh, payment at that point from the inventory that you've ordered right, right before Chinese New Year, it's coming in at least the way that our cycle was, and having to pay the, these taxes on money that you've never seen because, like, our business was profitable on paper, but all that cash is going back in the business. So, here we have six figures of profit that we're showing on our tax return, and Mike Jackness has never seen a single penny of that money. And, and it's just mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, now I got to pay a six figure tax bill on money that that we just haven't seen yet. You know, that hasn't come out of the business. It's still in the business, buying more inventory and going to work. So you just got to be careful about all that. Um, so those were definitely stressful moments. At one point we got down to having uh, very, very, very low five figures in the bank uh, on a business that was doing millions of dollars a year. That's a small amount of cash. Right. Percentage um, wise. Yeah. Percentage wise. It was, it was intense. Um, but we made it and because we did good planning and everything, we were okay. Um, but yeah, that's definitely stressful. And it was, you know, but I, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And I, you know, everything worked out. So I, you know, it's easy to say now in, in hindsight uh, that it was smart and the right thing to do. But, you know, I feel like these types of opportunities only come by so many times in your life. I mean, as an entrepreneur, if you're a lifelong entrepreneur, like I have been, uh, you will wander many years like be a journeyman or a wanderer like through life mm-hmm. and try this and try that and it's not really working you tinker with this and tinker with that and it's not really working that great and then you find something that is working you got to take advantage of it because like these are things that and i knew even back then i didn't know how it was going to 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 become different because it's like hard to predict the future i just knew that if it was this easy for me to make money that other people were going to figure that out mm. and and they have you know and so i mean Tons of people have flooded the Amazon market now. Uh, Amazon's changed all of its rules. You know, we can't do things in the same way that we used to. And so if I hadn't pushed the, the envelope and pushed things as hard as I did at the time that I did, I'd be regretting it now. You know, I'd, I'd have less to show for it. So that's why we, we stuck with it for, that, for the time that we did. And as soon as I saw things changing and that it was, you know, that the, the risk profile was shifting from being a 95% chance to, to win the 90 to 85 or whatever. I was like, you know what? It's now time to, to take the foot off the gas. Not, uh, you know, I think that, you know, it's kind of like the book who moved my cheese, not just going and doing the same thing over and over again, because it's working. Let's, let's change along with the changes. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what precipitated all of it as well. Cause I would have stuck with it uh, and done another hundred percent year over year growth. Uh, was kind of the target was to do that. Um, but I felt like it was a, a just too risky to, to do it. I mean, it was, you know, we, we, yes, there was an opportunity to take the thing to the, you know, in the, in the eight figures and, and have a mid seven figure cash out instead of a low seven figure cash out. Um, but the risk was, was just too big to, to take that chance. I think for, for me, you know, and everyone's different. Some people might have uh, continued on, you know, if I was 20 years younger, I probably would have said, let's, roll the dice and go over another year and, and right. let this thing grow a little bit more, another hundred percent, but I'm not, you know, and then you just, and, and those are things in life that are hard to, to accept sometimes that, that you're not 20 anymore. And, you know, do I want to start all and have an opportunity, not an opportunity, but a, the risk of having to start all over again at 40 versus at 20 is a, is a big difference. Well, definitely. So yeah, as to your point, like we, uh, we, we can't seem to get the, the clock to go backwards. You know, maybe we can get some creams that make the wrinkles less or, you know, we can uh, save some of our hair before it falls out or something like that with uh, technology and medical science, but we yeah. can't make the clock go backwards. Yeah. So yeah, it's the, the unfortunate thing. Um, so with the, you still, cause you know, you and I are around the same age. So I, I like to think that we still have a lot of runway still in front of us. So yeah. what, what is your, your vision for where you're going with the uh, the three businesses you still have and kind of where you see your entrepreneurial future and how you plan for that. Yeah. So, I mean, this is going to get very philosophical. I wasn't expecting this question, but so bear <laughs> with me for, for a minute uh, it's for me to go off on Mike's deep thoughts land. I love it. But, yeah. Um, so th- there was a time when I was 30 
that I basically retired and mm -hmm. um, you know, we bought an RV and traveled around for a couple of years. And I thought I would just enjoy life and do, and do that um, from the other businesses that we had. Cause we, we did really well. And, and you know, I'm basically a minimalist anyway, don't really need a whole lot. Like I have no desire to own a private jet and 17 houses and a yacht and all that. Like I have no desire to go do any of that. Right. Um, you know, I would, I would donate the money with well before I would ever go, go spend that type of thing on myself. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we were, we were RVing and, and, and doing that and basically had retired. And, and I realized that I just missed it too much. You know, I was, I, I think entrepreneurship, uh, when you're like I, I am, like there's different types of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. um, but the type of entrepreneur that I am, I, I consider myself to be, uh, the, the diseased entrepreneur, you know, like, I think it's like the same as like alcohol, alcoholism or, you know, being right. addicted to heroin. Or, I mean, I feel like it's that strong of an addiction to me. Like it really feels that way. Um, something I've had, a, had, had to deal with. I mean, and, and that manifests itself in ways like, uh, you know, working 80, 90 hours a week and ignoring your friends and family and uh, ignoring your own personal health and well being because you're so into your business and uh, it has nothing to really do with the money as much as like, it's the thrill of, of entrepreneurship, just like, again, an alcoholic or a gambler or anybody else that has these types of problems. And so I, I um, the way that I got sucked back into e-commerce was very obvious that this was a problem. And, you know, so the thing that I'm working on now is, is a balance of that that I'm pretty happy with. I mean, I've, I've worked really hard. This has been something I've had to spend a lot of time to make sure that I'm getting it right. And, um, and, and basically, yeah, I, I, I know that I love being an entrepreneur. I know that I can't go to zero and just and walk away from it. So it's how can I not do the Tim Ferriss four hour work week kind of thing, right. but maybe the four hour work day. Um, and so I'm, you know, have worked really hard to get to that and, uh, and also be a minimalist and, and do these types of things. So I think that uh, if I was to, you know, hopefully we can come back a year or two from now and uh, this will be the way things you know play out. But the idea is to, to, to work a lot less and, and be more productive in the hours that I am working and spend more time. And I've, I've done a good job spending time with friends and family and, and traveling and doing the things I, I've done a good job with that over the last couple of years, but uh, to take it to a, just a little bit more of an extreme uh, and, and kind of, like I said, more, more of a four hour work day, being in an environment where I like to be, which is traveling or out on the road. We mm -hmm. bought another RV ironically. Uh, so we're going to be doing that <laughs> some more. Um, and, and doing some international travel as well. Um, but, but sticking with the things that I enjoy, which is, I, mean, I, I, I love business and entrepreneurship, which is, you know, it, which is why I love doing Ecom Crew so much. You know, I love doing the podcast. I love doing training. I love, you know, the blog posts. I love doing the road show. I love going and speaking at events and talking to other entrepreneurs. Like I can't kick that. I don't want to kick that. Like that's the thing that I want to spend time doing. That's what I want to spend my time doing. And, um, you know, if it was up to me, I would spend all my time doing nothing but that. Mm -hmm. Um, but the problem is if like I was to sell all my e-commerce stuff and do nothing but that, I would become irrelevant within a year or two because e-commerce changes so quickly. So I think like I need an e-commerce business to, um, to help with, with like, as a case study, if nothing else for, for what I'm doing on the part that I love. So we'll continue to run uh, some e-commerce businesses to, to help with that. Um, but do it in a capacity where it, it's, it's enjoyable and not, uh, you know, it's a lifestyle business more than it has been up to this point. Cause up to this point, it was definitely not the lifestyle business. And um, again, I don't begrudge people that, that want to be either way. I mean, you have the Bill D'Alessandro's of the world that are in Charlotte with a 50,000 square foot warehouse. And mm -hmm. he goes to the office every day and, and wears nice clothes and manages his employees. And, and, you know, I did that for the last you know four or five years as well here in, in Southern California. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then you have the old bill that was, before that, that was out, uh, you know, skiing every day and it was a lifestyle business. So at different points of our life, we want different things. And for me, it's, it's more about the lifestyle than, than anything else. It's the number one important thing before anything else. And so it's shifting that priority. Um, and we'll see how, how that goes. And, and just every day thinking about it, I think is important, you know, not letting it become where you lose track of that. And that's been where I've screwed up in the past where I just like, you throw caution in the wind. I'm going to go do this because this is a great opportunity. Um, you know, what's the why? Like, wh what's the outcome that you're looking for? Is it worth? You're, you're trading something. You're trading your time. You're trading your money. You're trading your well-being. Whatever, for for something else. There is no even uh, 
you know, or you can't have your cake and eat it too. It, that only exists in fairy tales. So, you know, it's uh, being very cognizant of that, I think, is, is kind of the way of the future for me. That's, that's a good point. There is always a trade off. You can't be the total workaholic, uh, which I've been very guilty of myself, and you can't be the total four hour work week person. You know, maybe there is a trade off somewhere in the middle um, where you can find some level of meaning. And, you know, maybe it's as we get to the 40 something mark, we start questioning the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the meaning of life uh, a little bit differently than maybe we yeah. did when we were younger. No doubt about it. We get to different stages, so not to get too involved in you know making this uh, <laughs> middle aged man uh, show. <laughs> um, so if if you were reading that end of the chapter that you just finished, and I know you don't like to necessarily look back on the past, but if you were to say to someone who may be there on chapter one and you just finished chapter 37, you know, so in their e-commerce business, they're in like the first few chapters somewhere along. Yeah. What would you hope that they got out of chapter 37 that you just finished? Hmm. That's an interesting question. So they're, they're, they're starting out, they're just starting out and they, by the time they get to chapter 37, like what did they get out of it? So, okay. So they're on their own chapter. They're in somewhat in the new to intermediate stage of their business. They're not mm -hmm. looking for a product, but they're up and running. But let's say they're in their first year of e-commerce and they're reading your story, the chapter you just finished. What would you hope that they take out of it so that maybe they could save some of the heartache that you've been al had along the way? Yeah. I mean, I would say there's a few things here. I mean, some of these things I learned earlier in other businesses. So the chapters probably started before e-commerce, but you know, it's important to, to keep the why in mind, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the, it, it's easy to get caught up. Like, why are you doing this? Is it to, to, to show up amongst your friends? You know, when you go to a conference, I mean, everybody uh, throws these numbers around either you're a six figure seller, you're a seven figure seller, you're eight figure seller, you kind of get thrown in these buckets. And are you pushing for that? Just, just for that, for the, for the glitz and glamor of, of those lights um, of, of being at the cool kids table or whatever, right. um, or is it, is there another reason behind it? You know, so for me, the reason behind it was um, I thought it was a good opportunity at the time and to take advantage of it. And cause I know that that stuff doesn't come along. Uh, but at the same time, like I do looking back at it, realize I have to admit to myself, which I'm mad at myself about is that I did get caught up uh, in that a little bit. You know, you get caught up in, uh, talking to your peers and, and kind of gloating a little bit of I doubled again this year and comparing notes and um, that that's bad. I mean, like it, it definitely is not, that doesn't, there, nothing good comes out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's a pretty common human instinct to want to go do that. And even knowing that I don't want to do that, I still kind of did that, you know, just being honest and, and being realistic of the last year, especially as I was pushing things, even though it was creating a bunch of stress, it was like, Oh, this is now I get to go, uh, you know, talk to, to, to Scott, let's say, or whatever. And right. you know, gloat about how, you know, I, I did 8 million last year or <laughs> whatever. And, um, you know, we're just, and, and there's definitely some ego thing there of, uh, you know, whoever has the bigger numbers, like better in some way, even though that's not the case. And, you know, another thing I talk about a lot anyway, is that number absolutely is, is actually completely meaningless. It's the one that really matters to the bottom line number. You can drive top line numbers really easily. I wish we all started talking about how much do you actually make more than mm. uh, in, in terms of in terms of revenue, which mean is a meaningless number, especially in mm. e-commerce. Um, you know, so I would say just be cognizant of that. You know, just do it for for whatever reason you're trying to do it for. Like, remember why you got into it to begin with. Was it was it for freedom? Well, you know, I bought myself a job through those four years. Those are right. four or five years I can never get back. That I was stock in an office and, and working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, 90 hours sometimes, um, you know, there, there's a trade off to that, you know, so you, would I have been better off um, working 40 hours a week and making a company that was half the size and, and uh, you know, and, and, and doing the things that are important to me in my life. I mean, it's hard to say, um, but I would definitely say, uh, you know, keep that stuff in mind, you know, and, and not get lost about again, why, why you started the whole thing to begin with. Because most people get into entrepreneurship for some, some reasons other than that they're like a diseased entrepreneur. Usually it's, you know, they're, they're, they want to spend more time with their family or they want to just be able to go to the beach and, or go sailing on a Wednesday afternoon without having to have anybody to go 
answer to. And you know, so I found myself having to answer to my own employees, right? You get, and you, you're having to, to, to lead by example and deal with these things. And you get, there's a lot of things that come out of it, um, you know, that repercussions, the unintended consequences. So, you know, try to think about those things uh, would be probably a thing that I would encourage people to be thinking about earlier on and in, in, in the entire way along the journey. And even if you're thinking about it, even like me, like I was thinking about this stuff all the time and sometimes there's just like you, you, your business ends up running you instead of the other way around and definitely got to that point for, for a while there. That's, that's really good advice. I mean, cause it's that saying that, you know, sometimes we're ahead, sometimes we're behind, but at the end of the race is only with ourselves. And I think it is very easy to get caught up in, you know, whatever it is we're comparing, you know, to other people. Yep. Um, and we're all guilty of that. And it kind of reminds me of, so last week I saw, the live action version of Aladdin and <laughs> Will Smith was uh, the genie and you know, he's doing the, you know, you never have a friend like me skit of, you know, introducing that, you know, he's there to grant the three wishes. And he had this kind of like throwaway line that has just stuck with me for ever since. And it, it's kind of along the lines of what you're saying is that he was saying, you know, you could ask for money, you can ask for power. And then he was like, kind of like, well, but if you ask for money or power, I can guarantee you, there's never an end to that. So like you could, you could wish away and wish away and wish away and wish away, but you could never get to that end of the money and the power thing. So yep. it's that not exactly the same thing, but it's kind of on that, that wavelength of really get into the meaning of why you're doing things as it, you know, to be able to spend more time with your family or to, um, you know, to, to create something, you know, to have, have a legacy, what, what, whatever that is should be, more of your driving factor um, and less about the, you know, the numbers because they get, they do get exciting. Like I'm very guilty of it. Like I have a thumb that hurts <laughs> going yeah. on Amazon's app and looking up to see what my sales are because I'm constantly looking, you know, yeah. so, like, it's addictive. I mean, it's highly addictive. Yeah, it totally is highly addictive. So yeah, th this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate that you uh, are willing to dive so deeply on you know your your mindset, and I think it's fascinating for uh, those that are listening to this to hear someone that's gotten to you know the levels of where you've gotten, and you still have you know that sense of humility, and um, you know that you're you're able to check yourself, and I think that's something that's so valuable um, yeah. you know, in this business. Yeah, I mean it's uh, I. I I don't know. It, it's something that's was originally uncomfortable for me. Cause it's like, it's definitely tough to expose some of these thoughts and things that you're talking about. But um, I also realize that very few people talk about this stuff, which is why I think so many people get themselves in this position. Mm. And, you know, so that I feel like it's kind of a public service in some ways to talk about <laughs> right. some of this stuff because, you know, if, if more people start talking about it, then maybe it'll be on people's radar more. And um, yeah. So I mean, I think, and, and, sometimes like Bill using Bill Alessandro again as an right. example, he, uh, he told me something once that, that really stuck with me, which was sometimes you got to make yourself uncomfortable mm. uh, you're going to be successful. You know, you gotta, sometimes you gotta, you gotta make yourself uncomfortable. So that's actually how I got into in the speaking to begin with, cause I didn't want to do it. And that was his comeback was, well, sometimes you gotta make yourself uncomfortable. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Like I always gravitate towards the things that I'm comfortable with, like that I know that I'm, that I'm really good at, you know, business and, online marketing and Facebook ads and email lists and all these whiz bang, you know, things. But right. the thing that was uncomfortable with me, you know, going out and speaking in front of 300 people uh, was really uncomfortable. But the reality is, is that because I did that and I learned how to make that more comfortable and I did that uncomfortable thing, uh, it's opened up another whole thing in my life. You know, this uh, public speaking stuff and podcasting and things that it never would have happened. And, and the, the end result of that has been that, I've met an incredible cast of incredible people that I never would have met otherwise. And I could pick up the phone or send an email to any thought leader in e-commerce and get a reply, which is mm -hmm. pretty awesome, you know, versus, uh, you know, five years ago, I, my email wouldn't even, they made it past their secretary. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it just, you know, the ability to, to, to be around other people like this and learn from them as well and, and be a part of that conversation uh, you know, has helped in so many ways. So that was all started from just doing something that's uncomfortable. And um, so I've taken that to the next level and started talking more about, you know, these types of things because 
you know, a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with the same things. You know, we end up in the same situations, but they're things that are often not talked about. You can't talk about them with your employees. You can't talk about them right. with your friends because they, they don't even understand what the hell it's like to run a business. And, um, you know, it's, uh, so you go to events or you start, you know, going, getting into masterminds and having opportunities to do this stuff. And, uh, you, know, you realize everyone's dealing with the same thing. You know, we, we all deal with the same thing, you know? And so I just, I think it's important to, to, to talk about it sometimes. So yeah, it's been weird, but, uh, kind of cool at the same time. Yeah, it's it's a very good point because um, as they say, there's there's nothing new under the sun, and so the, the <laughs> right. struggles that we think that we have that are so unique, um, you know, someone else has a a slightly different flavor of that same struggle. So as they say, we are the uh, um, I think it was Jim Rohn that said we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So yeah, so all good advice there to to find um, folks to uh, you know connect with and things of that nature. So. Um, so if somebody wanted to, you know, hear more about what you have to say out there in the world or, you know, wanted to connect to you in some ways, uh, how would they uh, go about finding uh, you in the, the, the internet space? Yeah. So, I mean, all this stuff and more we're talking about all the time at Ecom Crew. Um, it's a podcast, a blog, training, free courses, basically anything to do with e-commerce and business, we're doing it in some capacity. Um, E-C-O-M-C-R-E-W on iTunes, ecomcrew.com, support at ecomcrew.com if you want to email me, ecomcrew on all the social media. It's all consistent, all ecomcrew. Nice, nice. Well, I, again, I thank you so much for uh, for coming on here and anyone who's not listening to Ecom Crew, I'm a subscriber, definitely love it. Thank um, you. I, I would uh, <laughs> highly recommend. Um, you and my mom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I got two, yeah. <laughs> I've met some of your super fans, so I know that you've got <laughs> quite a few subscribers. So, uh, but yeah, you're uh, um, very giving of the information you give, just as you've been very giving on this interview. I know that you are consistently in ecom crew and other places. I found you. So, thank you so much for what you do for the uh, the e-commerce world. Happy to do it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Mike.